Okay, we are going through the Bible in a year, 230 miles an hour. For a little bit, we slowed down there. Well, I guess that's what happens every once in a while when you're on the train. It slows down when it's going into the station, and it's kind of what happened to us. We slowed it down a little bit, and now we're taking off and going a little bit faster again. The last couple of days, we did one book each day. So we are in the last of the 12 books of history in the Old Testament. We are in a book called Esther. So we give a little bit of history. We keep doing this. But you're going to know, we're all going to know it by the time we get through here. We get through the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the Law of Moses, and we get to <clears throat> history books. And what happens in those history books is the book of Joshua. He leads them into the land. Those children that we learned about, the family of Abraham that we learned about in the Torah. They go into Egypt for uh, 400 years. They come out and Joshua brings them out and they begin to settle into the land. He gets the 12 tribes all situated into the land, the land that's known as Israel. And then we get into the book of Judges, which takes 400 years, and these guys are trying to serve the Lord and not doing very good, and they get into this whole cycle of sin and <clears throat> bondage and then being overtaken by their enemies and calling out to God and God raising up a deliverer and freeing them. And then they do the same thing. They do this over and over again for 400 years. But God's their king. They have no earthly king. We get to the books of First and Second Samuel. They're asking for a king. And in those books, First and Second Samuel, we find out about the kings, the first couple of kings, God being the first king, uh, Saul being the second king, King David being the third king, and Solomon, when we get into First and Second Kings, Solomon being the fourth king. After Solomon, there's a civil war over taxes, and uh, they settle in the north, ten tribes, and two in the south. And so the north becomes known as Israel, and they become idolaters in Judah. They try to stay uh, to the word of God, but it's a slow downward spiral. Well, the northern kingdom, because of their uh, idolatry and not serving God, they end up being conquered by the kingdom of Assyria, the world governing empire of Assyria, conquers them, and they pretty much fall they end up mixing with uh, the other peoples there. And so they're no longer purebred <clears throat> Hebrews like the ones in the South. And the ones in the South are going to take issue with that. 150 years later, Southern Kingdom falls. But it falls to Babylon. Well, that's because Babylon conquered Assyria. And so it falls to Babylon, and they export an awful lot of the people, loads and loads of people. They export them to Babylon. Jeremiah said that they would be there for 70 years. That's how long they were there. And uh, while they're there, what happens is Persia arises as a world-governing power, and Persia ends up conquering Babylon. So some of these Jews they went into Babylon. They're now in Persia. And that's where we pick up in the book of Esther. Now, they had gone back. In fact, the last two books that we looked at, Ezra and Nehemiah, was about these Hebrews in Babylon that had trickled back. Um, 50,000 of them at, at one time, and Ezra is leading them back. And they're coming out of Persia now, right? They had been exiled into Babylon, but now they're coming out of Persia because Persia is the world-governing empire that had conquered Babylon. So an awful lot of them are back in the nation, but not all of them. Because keep in mind, they've gone into Babylon, and now Persia is controlling the same territory. Some people say there might have been a million Jews, maybe two million, maybe as many as three million Jews, that really never trickled back to Jerusalem, to the, to the land of Israel. And so there are some there, and there's a lady named Esther, and her relative, um, Mordecai. So they're there, living there, they're Jewish people. And of course, there's a king, and these Persian kings, they have absolute power. Everything that they say is law, and you can't change it. Once they've said it, that's it, you can't change it. 
Well, there's a, there's a king, his name is Xerxes, and he has a queen because uh, <clears throat> kings have queens. And so um, Xerxes, uh, his wife, the queen, um, she was a little hard to get along with, at least for him and everything about her, but he, uh, he's going to get another queen and all of his advisors advise him, you know, get another queen. So he gets, he gets rid of his queen. He gets rid of her. And, um, he finds this girl, Esther is her name. Well, really, uh, that's not her name. Her name is Hadassah. Her name is Hadassah, but her Persian name is Esther. So this girl, Esther, maybe they say the word means star. Um, she's, uh, adopted. She's adopted. She's an orphan, but she's adopted by her relative Mordecai. And so after Xerxes chooses this girl, she's Jewish. She's Jewish. And um, a lot of the Jewish people would hide their identities. Um, they weren't you know, always particularly liked, you know, they're in Persia. But um, after Xerxes chooses her to be queen, Mordecai, her relative, he was, you know, was sitting around the king's gate in, in communicating with uh, Esther, made it so that he could communicate with her. And so um, because he hung around there, he heard about a couple of the guards that were going to assassinate the king. They were going to assassinate Xerxes. Well, he tells Esther, he says, you know, go tell the king that these guys are going to assassinate him. And so she does. And as a reward, um, you know, the king's supposed to give some reward. Well, it goes into the official records that uh, it was Mordecai who spared the king's life. Mordecai that spared the king's life. But there was no reward. Just kind of went on. Well, sometime later, here's the next character. So we have a girl named Hadassah, a Jewish girl, ends up being called Esther. She becomes the queen to Xerxes. Her relative who had raised her, Mordecai, he's the one who hears about the plot. Esther goes and tells the king. So uh, Mordecai saves the king's life. Sometime afterwards, there's this new character. Haman is his name. And Haman is, uh, he's power crazy. He's, uh, he's kind of nuts, this guy here. And he becomes second in command to Xerxes. And one of the things that he does when he's second in command is uh, he wants everybody to bow down to him. Well... Haman wants everybody to bow down to him, but Mordecai, he's got that old Jewish thing in him. You know, we don't bow down to anybody. We bow down to the creator, the maker of heaven and earth. He's not going to bow down. Well, the, you know, Haman, he goes nuts over this. He can't, he can't stand this. So, so he gets the king, he gets King Xerxes <clears throat> to make this decree that anyone that... You know, he says, hey, this guy, he's disrespectful. He won't bow down to the king. He won't bow down to me. And so what you need to do is you need to make some edict that, you know, people who don't do that, you know, should die in all of their people. So this is sort of interesting to us in the time that we're living in, because this is another plot to kill the Jews. Another plot to kill the Jews. Well, you know, what happens is uh, Esther, you know, she arranges a dinner with Xerxes the king in uh, and the king has a dream, and in the dream, he, he, uh, he, he well, he doesn't have a dream, he's agitated, um, having dreams that are agitating him. He wakes up and he reads the annals of history, and he finds out that Mordecai had saved the king. And he said, you know, what did anybody do to, to reward him? Nothing. And so now he's going to reward him, and um, uh, Haman is going to have to uh, give honor to him. So anyway, there's this decree to kill the Jews and Esther gets to the king and she tells him, you know, I'm going to die because of that decree. And he's all mad at Haman because of this. And so he can't change it, but he makes another decree that says that the Jews can all protect themselves that day, that the day that they're going to go out and kill him. And so the Jews are saved because of Esther. Esther saves the Jews. God gave her favor with everyone who saw her. You know, she turns to prayer and fasting and the Lord uses wisdom, you know, in dealing with Haman. Um, but 
But this whole story is about saving the Jews, saving the Jewish people, because there's always been an attack against them. Because if you can kill the Jewish race, then you can get rid of the genealogy of Jesus. Well, this, this book here, this book doesn't mention God, but God is all in it. And there's all of these things that just happened. You know, Esther happened to be selected as, you know, Vasti's the, the queen's successor. Mordecai happened to uncover the plan to assassinate the king. Um, you know, the king happened to have insomnia the night before Haman planned on killing Mordecai and all, and all of the Jews. And, and all of these coincidences are the realm of God, God saving his people. And so uh, though God isn't mentioned, he's the central character here. And Haman, who he was going to hang Mordecai on a gallows, and Haman ends up getting the gallows himself, ends up getting the gallows himself. So all of this stuff, all of this plot going on, and God is going to save his people. There's still, in this book, you have the heart of anti-Semitism. Too bad we couldn't go deeper. Always this thing to get rid of the Jews, all through history, all through history. And even now, we have it again. It's demonic. So uh, we're going to move on. Hey, bless you guys.